do. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, good morning again. It's encouraging that so many of you have come to my second talk. This is always a good sign. <laughs> uh, I hope you're enjoying yourself as much as I am. Uh, it's really uh, great to be participating in this event. And I'd like to thank uh, Woody and all the organisers uh, for making it uh, so efficient and making me feel uh, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Right, okay. So, uh, yesterday I talked about um, a small genus which is very suitable for pop culture, uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, bigger plants, uh, which many of are still very suitable for pop culture. They're not all trees, there are lots of columnars which are actually quite small. So I could flower lots of them in my glass house in England, but you here, of course, have got a chance of growing many of them outside. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the environments they grow in, and that might give you a clue as to which ones would be suitable for growing where you live. So, you already know, of course, that Peru is on the uh, west coast of South America. Uh, it's the third largest country. I can't compete with Marlon's homeland. Uh, that, of course, is the largest. Argentina is second, and Peru is the third. And here's an image uh, that shows you uh, the size of Peru in relation to the United States to give you an idea uh, that it's quite a big place. Uh, so it takes quite a bit of getting around uh, and the roads aren't as good as yours <laughs> so uh, it can take you quite a while to get from one place to another. <clears throat> Lots of people come to Peru. Let's have a show of hands of how many people have been to Peru. Oh, well, there you are then. I must say, <laughs> when I ask people in England that question, I only get a very few. <laughs> so it's good to hear that so many of you have been to this wonderful country. So I guess um, you might have gone to look at the cacti, but you've also most probably gone to see Machu Picchu, which is one of those places that really you ought to try and see. Um, a lot of people go to Lake Titicaca on the left here, and many people go to the city I showed you yesterday, Huaraz, which is great for trekking. Now, we heard uh, from Marlon about the uh, cacti of uh, this area here. These um, are areas of um, a number of genera uh, present in different parts of uh, South America. Uh, so one of the hotspots is eastern um, Brazil here, and Peru does pretty well uh, in the Andean part of the country here. Uh, if you then move on and look at, um, uh, at uh, columna cacti, you'll see again uh, that Peru has many of them. And uh, it's generally believed that the evolution of cacti started in Peru and then radiated out across South America and ultimately into North America. Uh, and there's interesting plants in Peru that are perhaps um, give you a clue as to what cacti looked like a long time ago. Mm. Um, there are currently recognised 21 genera of columnar cacti in South America. The ones with the little asterisks are those that are endemic. The reason that there aren't more is that the northern Peru is very like southern Ecuador. So quite a few of the um, plants which are mainly centred on Peru uh, extend up into Ecuador. And similarly in the south, the northern Chile is similar to southern Peru. So you get quite a few that go over that border as well. It's quite interesting that there are some plants uh, that just fit rather nicely uh, into the country of Peru. They seem to be rather shy about going over the border. They get within two, 10 kilometers and they say, well, I'm not going. Well, you know, the paperwork on the borders in southern Peru. <laughs> so um, who went to look? Well, Peru has been a place where lots and lots of explorers, of course, have gone. Um, and I'd just like to mention uh, a few of the uh, major contributors uh, to the plants that I'm going to show you later. Uh, so it all really started at the end of the 18th century um, when uh, Humboldt and Bonplant, I'm sure you all know Humboldt, he's had plants named after him, currants named after him, all sorts of things. And he, he travelled in northern Peru and discovered quite a few plants um, which we know today, including Esposto alanata, for instance. Although, of course, at the time that he did his travels, the only genus available to him, of course, was Cereus. So uh, it was up to later workers to come up with these new generic names. Um, 
Weber Bauer is also commemorated in a number of cacti, Weber Bauer Serias and Machicana Weber Bauer. He was also German. Did I mention the other day how much work the Germans had done in South America? Well, you know, they, they seem to like the place. They, they've been there a lot. So he, he, found, he found, and a lot of them are still there, I might say as well. Um, he, he did uh, travels in, in the early part of the 20th century, and then Fahapel described lots and lots of plants. And I have to hand it to these guys. They listed these plants, described them, and even today nearly all their species are recognised. So they were looking for really different plants. Weberbaum must have gone past lots of plants that he didn't describe. And the only thing I can think is that he only described plants when he could see the flowers and the fruits. If the plant was out of flower or out of fruit, he seemed to just sort of think, well, I'll do that one later. Um, and therefore, he left a few, of us to, a few for us to find, which is great. Mm. Um, now, they must be your heroes. They certainly are amongst mine. Um, Britton and Rose, uh, they created quite a few of the genera um, that, uh, that we accept today. Genera like Browningia, Curia cactus, Esposter, and Neramondia are all genera erected by Britton and Rose in their wonderful four-part book, which is well, well worth looking at. It looks sort of daunting, but you know, it's quite a good read actually, and it's in English, which is really a, a big advantage to me. <laughs> <laughs> Backerberg's work is almost all in German. Uh, he was a prolific author, and he had a nursery, and he did visit South America on a number of occasions and went to Peru often, and then he sold the seeds and plants that he uh, got uh, through various uh, uh, seed catalogues, and there's a couple of the examples uh, from the 1930s. Um, he was a tremendous cataloger of plants, uh, and in his uh, six-volume uh, uh, book, uh, it's probably the most sort of comprehensive description of the whole of the Cactaceae uh, in recent years, uh, it was his work that the New Cactus Lexicon endeavoured to bring up to date. <clears throat> Frederick Ritter, I think he has to be my top hero for, for uh, hunting for cacti in South America. That's a, quite an unusual picture of him in his garden when he lived in Chile. Um, but he, he took years and years and years before he wrote his books, and he didn't do that till the 1980s. And in those, he described lots of wonderful plants that he'd found. Uh, during his six visits uh, to Peru. Mm -hmm. And we must mention Professor Dr. Werner Rau. Um, obviously, we know Rau from uh, plants, Rau Aserius, for instance. Uh, he, he was a professor at Heidelberg University, and he did the first uh, book on the cacti of Peru in 1958, uh, which was his doctorate thesis. He visited Peru twice before that, and then many times afterwards, because he was interested in all sorts of plants, bromeliads and so on. And his book is really the first one that you should read. It's in German, of course, but it tells you an awful lot about the country. And uh, it, uh, working with Backerberg, he described many new plants. So uh, Peru consists of a, a series of, of parallel mountain ranges, the Andes uh, splitting up into a series of ridges that run north-south. Uh, and I, it's Lima, the capital city, is more or less in the middle of this vast country here. And I refer to the area south of that as southern and the area north of northern. That might seem very simple, but since I say it so often, I thought I ought to say what I mean. Um, it breaks into many uh, vegetation zones, but a simplified approach to this would be that you've got the left side, the side next to the Pacific, yellow in this map which is the arid coastal strip. It's in a rain shadow, so it's very dry. And it, again, rarely rains, but does get quite a lot of mist. And the plants depend on this. The plants that are there depend on this mist. And that varies from place to place. And you get some places which are very favored for mist. And these are called low mass. And they're good places to look for, for cacti. And then you get the coastal valleys, which get steadily less arid as you climb. Then the brown area, is the higher parts of the Andes. Now, there's lots of plants there, and lots of cacti, but there aren't many columnas. The columnas either are in the valleys on the west or in the valleys on the east. So I've split my talk into those two groups so that you can see which genera occur only on one side and which genera occur on both sides. Mm -hmm. So what do the coastal valleys look like? 
Well, they come up from the coastal plain. There's often a fairly flat starting part that you can easily get up, and then you end up going up really zigzag mountain roads to climb from sea level, uh, eventually up as high as, let's say, 4,000 metres. Uh, that's about 14,000 feet. Now, these valleys are quite isolated, so what's happened is that you find plants in one that don't occur in the next one. They've been isolated for quite a long time, although the Andes are still rising, of course. So some species have managed to populate many of the valleys, almost all of them, and others are only found in one. So it's quite interesting. Now, this is Werner Rau's uh, rather uh, clever drawing, and it gives you an idea of the way that uh, the uh, plants change as you go up the valleys. So here's the coastal plain. Uh, he's showing us some cacti here, uh, up to about 1,000 metres here. Well, uh, in fact, cacti will go all the way up here, um, uh, but it, when you get up to over 3,000 metres up here, uh, you don't find big kilometres. It's just not a suitable habitat. <clears throat> so the coastal plain is the place where the Pan American Highway runs. This runs the length of Peru. It isn't dual carriageway all the way, but it is, it is a tarmac all the way. And this is the principal arterial route of Peru. So if you want to get from north to south, the quickest way to do it is on the Pan American Highway uh, along the coast. Uh, I mentioned my good friend Paul Huxley yesterday, and you'll see that I credit quite a lot of his pictures. We've sort of worked on Peru together, and I've tended to do the north more, and he's tended to do the south more. So he's got recent digital pictures of the south. So I've used a lot of Paul's pictures, and I'm obviously very grateful to him for letting me do that. So this is a very useful road. It's very busy, but it's, it does make getting from north to south very quick. But getting from east to west is another story. You've got to go over the mountains, there are a few tarmac roads, but not very many. Uh, if they've had any rain, then it can be completely impossible. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the valleys um, tend to be uh, agriculture in, in, the, in the floors. Now, this is through um, uh, irrigation. Uh, the rivers are often completely dry, but at certain times of the year, uh, they do get a lot of water in them from snowmelt from the mountains and also from the rain that occurs in the mountains. And often they're dammed up, so uh, they create lakes and then use that water for irrigating the flat valley bottoms. But those valley sides, like I'm standing on here, or like Paul was standing on here, uh, is, is where the cacti uh, tend to be found. Um, and it, but it, you can see it's pretty arid. All, pretty well all of our pictures uh, tend to be taken in the southern spring, so most of these pictures will have been taken in October or November, even into December. So you do find a few cacti uh, just growing in favoured spots in amongst this uh, very sandy plain. But there aren't very many cacti uh, that inhabit that area. Then as you uh, climb up here, the Chiliti Valley, uh, you'll more and more um, cacti appear. And they tend to appear at certain altitudes. So a particular species will be associated with a particular altitude. So it's to do with the amount of moisture they get. So it gets less and less arid as you go higher up. The plants often occur in uh, multi-generic um, uh, groups together. Uh, between north and south, the species might vary slightly, but the genera tend to remain fairly constant. So the first things you tend to find are Neuromandia, growing with Hagiocereus and Espostoa. Mm. Um, in the drier valleys, like, uh, like this one, this is the Santa Valley, um, the, the, the plants don't necessarily get any water at all from year to year, it just depends. The years they get the most water is when there's an El Nino event. Now this is when the, the, the seawater uh, off the coast of Peru, uh, uh, well, I'm probably telling you so you know something about it because the El Nino affects you as well, doesn't it? The El Nino effect so the cacti in Peru is absolutely vital. This slightly warming of the water off, offshore greatly increases the amount of, of rainfall that they get. Uh, and sometimes uh, you get a flowering desert, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, I think seven to ten years, although recently uh, they've been more intense and they've been closer together. So when you get to about six or seven hundred metres, you can start to find what you might describe as cactus forests. 
And the main elements of these are usually Espostoa, Neromondia, and Hagiocereus. And there are globular plants here as well, so you'll find Melocactus here, and in sometimes you'll find Myla and other small growing plants. So Neromondia is the first one I'd like to talk about. I don't have my picture taken very often, although Marlon obviously did it without me knowing, I might say. Um, <laughs> But you, can, you get an idea, at least, that these Neromondias get pretty tall. Now, there's a number of names. Arikipensis is the oldest name. In the centre of the uh, country, they're pink flowered and they get called rosy floras. And in the north, they're really, really big, like this one, uh, and they tend to be called gigantia. But I think it's all the same thing. And they occur in, by their tens of thousands. So when you find them, there's often a lot. And they go right up the hills in the most arid environments. And that interesting, as was pointed out before, um, by the way that the areoles continue to flower for years and years and years. So here's examples of the areoles that are, are growing and growing and flowering probably year after year. The stem, this stem may not have grown for decades, and they probably won't grow a new stem until an El Nino year. And when that happens, they grow new stems at a fantastic rate. Huge arms appear and grow within a year. And, but they don't start to flower until they've stopped growing, and then the side, these, these areoles um, start, start to flower. It's a, it's, a nice, it's a very nice pot plant, this is. It has lovely big areoles, and really, uh, it, it's quite popular, even though it's a small seedling. Uh, oh, the only, I should mention its relative, the only other Neeromondia, uh, used to be in its own genus, and that's in Bolivia. And I've seen lots of what used to be near Cardenasia Herzogiana growing around here. It seems to do very well. Now, Espostoa is quite a large genus and an important one. They all have these side cephalia. In the coastal valleys in the south, um, you find Espostoa melanostelae. That is the coastal species. It occurs from south of Lima, uh, right up as far as the Rio Sanya Valley, where it's replaced by a form of Lanata, which has been called Prosera in the past. Uh, melanostelae was put in its own genus, pseudo Espostoma by Backerberg because it's the only one with glossy seeds. Most of the, all the others have matte seeds. But really, um, it's a minor difference, and today we tend to put them all in Espostoa. A close relative of Melanostelia, and perhaps a subspecies of it, is Espostoa nana. There was one sold in this very room last night, wasn't there? Well, this plant replaces Melanostelia in a few of the valleys in the north. And when we were there, uh, we went up some valleys that I don't think anybody had ever been up from Europe, and we extended the distribution of this much further north than was ever thought before. It makes a very nice plant to grow because it only gets about half the size or less than Melanostelia, and certainly for us, uh, it'll grow cephalium when it's much younger. <clears throat> so in the far north, it's replaced by a very tall plant. This plant grows to 25 feet, Espostoa procera, often considered to be part of the uh, Lanata um, um, species. Uh, and curiously, it, it's very prone to producing cristates. And if you look in Backerberg's books, you'll see that he amused himself by cutting quite a lot of these off and presumably selling them back in Germany for quite a lot of money. Uh, there's some fantastic pictures. You know, there's an existing video. Well, no, it wouldn't be a video, would it? It would be a... Uh, well, I saw it as a VHS uh, film of Backerberg actually hacking pieces of plants off. So he, was, he actually filmed himself and the film still exists, can you believe? Yeah, and he's got his pipe in his mouth, which he's carrying, while he's hacking at this plant. And the kit they wore as well, they must have been so hot, you know, he would look like he was dressed for dinner, this chap. Hmm? Amazing. <laughs> anyway, so the other genus that's common on the coast is Hagiocereus. And this is one of the few plants that you can actually find right on the very coast. I'll just take a drink. Where it's, where it's very, very dry. So the commonest one is Pseudomelanostele, which is the familiar one that I'm sure you, many of you grow with the golden spines. Hygiaceres don't have a cephalia. They're nocturnal flowering and usually white flowered, but there are a few populations that have red flowers. And when they uh, grow near Espostoas, which they nearly always do, um, you can get the hybrid. And here's an example of the hybrid. And you can see the hybrid has picked up little flecks 
of Cephalium from its Espostoa parent. Um, this part, this um, hybrid was called um, Neobuxbaumia by uh, Backerberg. They're really pretty plants with their dense spination. It isn't always um, uh, yellow, it can be white and sometimes black. And the flowers, there's the nocturnal flowers, they stay open a little bit of time in the morning. And I guess that they're uh, visited by a number of, um, of pollinators, but uh, I guess that bats have probably got something to do with it. But on the very coast, where it's really, really dry, uh, you can find a few species just living in what is basically a dry, sandy desert, living just on the moisture that drifts in off the very cold sea next door. Here, these are quite near the sea. So in the, in the north, you've got Repens and uh, uh, another one, uh, I'll, oh, I'll remember its name in a minute, T uh, Tenuis. And then in the south, down here, you've got, this is Paul's picture, of Australis. Um, they don't look as if uh, they're having too good a time of it, but um, there's plenty of them, and they flower, and they fruit. So it's perhaps not so bad. Oh, there's Tenuis. Tenuis. Tenuis on holiday on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> it's a holiday shot. Mm. <laughs> These plants are not actually very big. They're, um, they're no thicker than my thumb. Mm. This is a miniature. Mm. And it spreads all over. If you grow it in like a seed tray, it spreads all over and it flowers with lovely nocturnal flowers regularly. It's a pretty little plant. Very nice. Mm. Sometimes the spines are slightly plumose. Uh, they, they are dissected with little subspines. And this is an adaptation, presumably, to catch the mist. <clears throat> so, Hargioceris are one of the few genera that you find in these sort of very arid, uh, sandy places. Uh, it's not covered by this talk, but they often grow with these layers, uh, which of course are the Neopateria, area sizes that grow in the very south. Um, uh, but they often grow with these. There's the flower buds coming. Now, a genus I like very much, and I must say, this is extremely closely related to Hagiocereus. This is Loxanthocereus. Uh, and they often grow together, and they look remarkably alike, and it takes quite a long time to get your eye in to tell them apart. The fruits are very similar, seeds are similar, but these have day flowers, which are tubular, much shaped much like the Machicanas we were looking at yesterday, and classically thought to be hummingbird pollinated. But you know what I'm going to say next. I've never actually seen a hummingbird pollinate them. But there you go. I, 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 I think they must do, but I've never been there at the right time, probably. They're sometimes put into borsy cactus, um, but I think I'm inclined to leave them out like Joel did. Uh, I think they probably do. There is a, this DNA study, and I'm hoping that that will help us to finally decide. But for the for, the, for this talk, I've left them out of Borsi cactus. Mm. And there are a number of species, and they all have glorious flowers. And they're very common. When you find them, there, there tends to be a lot of them. So this is Salsifer, one of the ones. This is the furthest north, I think, of all of them. Um, and then in the south, um, you've got small, sprawling ones. So there's the two principal ones are Sextonianus, and this one, Gracilis, which used to be your, your, your um, compatriot Akers described that as uh, Maritimo serious. Mm. Uh, and then, remember I mentioned yesterday that um, my friend Paul, Paul Huxley, uh, discovered a new one further south than any other, and when it eventually flowered, the flowers were completely different from any other Luxanthus serious. Fruits and seeds are similar, plants look similar, but the flower is like the flower of Lobivia maximiliana. It's much smaller, um, tubular, uh, this amazing bicolor flower. These plants flower, for me in England, at less than two years old from seed. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny plant and it flowers and it flowers and it flowers all through the summer. So this is going to be a very nice pot plant to have and it's going to be common in no time because the thing flowers uh, from seed so young and produces fruit so easily that I can only think that uh, it won't be long before anybody that wants one can have one. Mm. So that's the new one. It was on the front of Bradley, by the way, uh, about two years ago when I described it for Paul. Um, oh, and thanks for the mention of Bradley, Jim. That's very kind of you. Mm. 
So, this is another very interesting one that you don't see in cultivation very often. It was originally distributed by Kanitsa as Senilioides, and then Ritter described it as Hoffmanni. He described it um, illegally, it wasn't a valid description, so I validated the description uh, with a, a plant that I, I, I had in culture. It's only growing in one valley, just south of Lima. Uh, Hoffmanni is a hairy one, the only hairy Loxanthoceris that I'm aware of. As you see, it looks like an Espostoa, and then produces a flower that you can only say is a Loxanthoceris flower. So that's a very nice plant. It's quite localised in, in, in this valley. Uh, there's a lot of plants there, but it's a small area. <clears throat> now we go on to our Metacereus. Now, people at home in England know I always joke about plants that are as ugly as sin. Well, you know, our Metacereus, I think, is a contender for the, probably, <laughs> for probably the, the least attractive um, cactus in Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have this phrase, the best left in habitat, yeah? You know? <laughs> So this is definitely best left in habitat. You might think differently, because you can probably grow it in your garden, um, but then they're tatty plants, you know, they're not very pretty, but you see they're quite common. When you find them, you tend to find a lot. The commonest one on the coast is Laetus, the oldest name, uh, and here it is. Um, this, is the, this is the type locality. This was one of the ones that Humboldt and Bonplant found all that, that time ago, back in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so serious layers as it was then, later to become our mato serious. And you see this fruit, it's quite a clever fruit this is. It's really, really spiny until it's ripe. And then when it's ripe, it falls off whole and sheds all its spines. Okay, now that's a clever, they're cleverer than they look, these plants, you know. That, that, that presumably is an adaptation so that some animal then can actually eat the fruit and, and cart off the seeds and move it around. If you left your, your armour of spines all the way around, it would make it unpalatable, wouldn't it? So they shed their spines when they're ripe. So they often grow with their amandia uh, in, the, in the valleys, and it's very widespread, right from uh, near the border with Ecuador all the way down to near the border with um, Chile. But it is endemic, it never goes outside the country. Uh, this is the, oh I'm sorry, it's not endemic, this species also occurs in Ecuador. Um, this is Cartwrightianus, it's the one that occurs on the coast. This has been greatly impacted by banana plantations, uh, because the flat coastal plain in southern Ecuador is used as a huge production of bananas. And this plant also grows there, but it's still there because it's on all the rocky outcrops. But it's not very nice. And the flower is nothing to get excited about, is it? Bats like them, bats like them. Um, now, the other one that's common in the coastal, coastal valleys between Lima, uh, around Lima, and north, up about as far as the um, uh, uh, Cordillera uh, Negra, uh, is Armatoceris prosperus, which makes huge forests. And it's quite a fastidious plant, you know, it has very upright branches, and it's one you don't very often see in culture. So I don't know whether this would be any prettier or any easier to grow, um, but uh, Paul managed to catch one in flower. But you can see they're very common. And as was mentioned with some other plants earlier, they, they, when you look at them in a group like that, they, they follow the, um, the places where the water will have run off the hill when it, on the few occasions when it rains. Mm -hmm. Now there's one, you can think I'm cheating here. Is this a columnar cactus? Well, I'm going to put it in as an honorary columnar, even though it probably uh, hardly ever exceeds a few inches tall. Um, Pygmia serious. Now, in the south, uh, there are, well, there's one species supposedly, although there are more, the, they, they look very different, and I suspect maybe that's overlumped. Um, they make these little sort of patterns in the, in the um, ground. They've got big tuberous roots. They have um, big, uh, long tubed, uh, small but long tube, uh, very sweet smelling uh, flowers at night, which I assume are pollinated by moths. Um, and Oh, and oh, it's something for the succulent. Yeah, this is, a, I think this is a, a clistanthe, is that right? I don't know. Hmm? That's the one in the south. Now, years and years later, there was a description of a plant called Pygmyceris beebly, which was said to come from 100 miles, 100 kilometers north of Huaras. Now, Ted Anderson went to look for it and he didn't find it. And nobody found it. 
And the reason they didn't find it is that unlike this one, which grows on the coast, Beebley grows on the top of a mountain, 600 kilometers away from this one. Mm -mm. And there it is, it's flat to the ground, a beautiful little plant, I think possibly one of the prettiest of the plants from um, Peru. Now, this was only found recently by chance. The road that goes to Siwas from the coast was destroyed by an earthquake that brought a mountain down and completely buried the road. And they just decided that putting another road there was a really bad idea because it'll happen again. So they put it over a completely different mountain. And what was it growing on that mountain? This. So this has got a main road next to it now, but only in the last few years. And since then, of course, everybody's been able to go and see it. So it grows high up. And then down in the valley below, people had driven past this, these places for years. It was so dry, they thought there's nothing can grow here. But here you find the Kuhasi form of it. This is a thousand meters lower down, and these plants can grow up to 10 inches tall. So we'd been driv driving past these for years, and I stopped on this occasion. And those of you near enough can actually see there's this plants in this picture, but you know, they look so much like the rocks. If you're driving, you'd, uh, you'd never stop. Very arid environment. And they're very different in culture. Uh, these are uh, uh, much finer spined and much bigger growing. Mm. Oops, sorry. So, um, there's one eulipnia that grows in Peru. There's lots, there's a, a, another, another five uh, that come from Chile, but there's only one from Peru, and that's called Rittery. And it was only known from uh, near the town of Camaná on the coast. And these are Paul's pictures of the few plants that are there. There's not many. But my intrepid friend Paul decided that there must be some somewhere else. So he looked on Google Earth and looked for tracks and looked for likely places. And a few kilometres north of here, about 30 kilometres north of here, he took a side road that went inland from the Pan Am. And he ended up finding a whole hillside covered with these plants, hundreds and hundreds of them. Not only were they bigger, but they were also a lot healthier and growing beautifully. So we know that now that this plant is actually uh, much more common than we thought. It's a nice plant to grow. I find Eulipnia's slow-growing plants. Mm. So, as you go up the valleys, and you can see the humidity hanging in the air here. Look how humid this is. The sea's behind here, and this humid air is, is coming inland and precipitating around and providing uh, moisture for the plants. So Weber Bauceris, named after Weber Bau that we mentioned earlier, it's closely related to Cleister cactus, um, but it has uh, back-pollinated flowers rather than the tubular, supposedly hummingbird-pollinated flowers of Cleister cactus. It's widespread, and there are different, uh, the different species have different shaped flowers, but I think they're all bat pollinated. And they get really quite big. These plants can grow to 25 to 30 feet tall, some of them. Um, the prettiest one is probably Winterianus or Johnstonianus, which is the lovely one with the golden spines. And when it flowers, it has a bristly crown, so that's nice. So, uh, rather sadly, it's often used as a grafting stock in Europe. I don't know what it is here, but uh, it does make quite a good grafting stock, actually. So that's one of the nicest ones, and that's from the northern valleys. Um, and then from the southern valleys, you get the, the plant called Rowie, and you can see from the um, chap standing on the right that the plant gets pretty big. Uh, this again can grow to 30 feet tall, named after Werner Rau, quite variable. Further south, you get Weber Bowery, which is similar, uh, but rather coarser spine. Now, we haven't finished with Weber Bowery series, we haven't finished with Espostoa but we've got to go to the other side of the Andes to see the others. So I'll show you those in a bit. Now, Oriocerus also occurs on both sides of the Andes. So here we are uh, in, uh, in uh, um, southern, southern, uh, southern Peru, uh, the flowers of uh, Leucotrichus. And these have big fruits, which the, the seeds dry out inside, and then they trickle out through a little hole in the bottom of the fruit. An Arequipa belongs to these, and even though the flowers of it are very like those of Machicana, they're not related. Um, they're, they're really distant. Uh, that it's just that the convergence has produced very similar flowers. Now, everybody's interested in Browningia candelaris. This was an old name, Mayan, uh, Mayan name from uh, southern uh, Peru, 
but it occurs over the whole of Peru, right from the south, right into Chile, and well up uh, to the north as well, around Lima is the furthest north it occurs. When the plants are young, uh, they're just a single spiky trunk. Eventually, when they mature, they produce a, a candelabra head of naked branches. It's tempting to think that these um, lived in a place where there were large animals that would have eaten the plants, but so they, could, they don't need spines above the height that the animal can graze. There were no giraffes here. We've seen about giraffes, well, nothing like that ever lived here, I don't think, but they certainly were large animals here, and I think that must be an adaptation to that. You see they eventually get rather large, they, they live in quite arid environments. They never occur in dense stands. They're usually just odd plants. Closely related is Browningia microsperma, also occurs in Ecuador. Not a very pretty plant, but quite nice as a seedling. And this also has bristly crown uh, where it flowers. Here's Paul standing next to Browningia hertlingianus, which you may know as an Azuria cereus. Uh, it's, it's the bluest of all the cereoids uh, from uh, Peru, uh, and you can see that it's nocturnal flowering with these amazing black buds opening to these rather pretty white flowers. That picture was actually taken at night by Paul. This is a very nice plant to cultivate, and I have seen them growing here. Hardly ever seen in cultivation is Ritter's Browningia candelaris, uh, Browningia columnaris. Now it grows very near Browningia hetlegianus. They're within sight of each other. But the big difference is that this grows on gypsum. Gypsum is extremely rare in South America, extremely rare. I only know of very few places where I've seen any gypsum. And on just a few gypsum outcrops, this plant occurs. I think we were the first people to see it since Ritter discovered it. It has smaller flowers than, the, than, the, than its sister species, but it's also very blue. In fact, as seedlings, it's even bluer. Now, Coriocactus is another gene that's best left in habitat, probably. They become extremely scruffy. Um, the, the one you hardly ever see is Brachypetalus, uh, but it's got a nice flower. The one that's got an even nicer flower is Brevistylus, which is from higher altitude. But they're very scruffy, the plants are. There's more dead than alive, usually. Um, but <laughs> they're the two big ones. Now, we also include a Dizier in Coriocactus, which are little plants, and they make quite nice pot plants. Now, I should talk about Borsicactus. These come from the north and from Ecuador. And they've, they've got generally tubular uh, flowers. They, they normally get quite a good size. Here's Plagiostoma, um, and the plant in the middle, which I didn't get, caption, is Samnensis. Um, these uh, both come from San Pablo. They, they grow side by side, in fact. And the one I'm sure you've all grown is Icosagonus. Um, I call this uh, Icosagonus subspecies Humboldti because uh, this was another one of those discovered by Humboldt and Bonpland, and they um, gave the locality of Peru. Uh, the other forms of uh, Icosagonus, which are very different, uh, occur in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. There's an article in Bradley about that if you want to read it up. Uh, but this is a sprawling plant with nice orange flowers that grow from a, 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 a very uh, a hairy zone at the top. Now we're going to go to the inland. This is the second sort of um, uh, habitat type. Often the plants are very dense on this side, they get more rain on this side because the rainfall is coming up from the Amazon on the east side. So you get dense stands of cacti on this side. And another one of Rao's diagrams shows a typical valley. Now you'll see that the sides of these valleys are really high now. This is 5,000 meters, right? So that's 17, 18,000 feet. So the cacti only, the columnar cacti anyway, only occur in the very bottoms. Higher up you find a puntias and uh, things like a roya. The Marignan Valley is the classic habitat for many cacti. Um, Browningia um, come from here, uh, Browningia uh, pilifer. Uh, it's an absolute, the Marignan Valley is the most magical place. Um, and I'm sure John Trader will be interested to see uh, that it's the locality of uh, Peperomi Wolfgang Crani, which is on this year's uh, ISI distribution. Um, I have to say, in the wild, it's extremely common, this plant. You can hardly walk without standing on it, but what a pretty plant that is. I, could, I, th I think I could see the attraction of, of succulents, but I'm trying to resist the dark side, you know. You, you know. <laughs> but there's no shortage of cactus. <laughs> Dense forests, um, consisting of Armatocereus balsasensis, balsasensis, yes, 
um, Brown Ingia, uh, Pilefair, uh, and, uh, and um, also uh, Esposto and Mirabilis. Mm -hmm. The roads, I mentioned the roads yesterday. Uh, I always mention them because it's one of the things that I dream about. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> it's... Uh, it's less dangerous than it looks, as long as you can't... By the way, there are some pictures here that I'd rather you didn't tell my wife about. Is that okay? Um, she, she, uh, she worries about me, you know, and I tell her only part of the story, to be absolutely honest. But So I'd like it to be a secret between us that I go on roads like this, okay? But you have to go down roads like this because the good stuff's at the end of roads like this. You know, it's not next to a freeway. You know, it's down there. <clears throat> So Browningia pilifer, very widespread uh, in the in the Marignan, has these naked flower, uh, naked tubes, uh, and eventually followed by naked fruits. Uh, a weird plant, really. Very spiny when it's young, and practically naked when it's older. Mm -hmm. Growing with it, Armatoceres rowi, the tallest of all the Armatoceres in my experience. This plant can grow to oh, 30, 35 feet. Quite fastidious, quite upright segmented stems, uh, a, a nocturnal pink flower, mm -mm. more large web of They're all sort of bigger here because they get more water. So these are big plants. Uh, an, an open flower, quite an open flower, another bat flower, quite smelly really. Mm. The web of that hardly anybody ever grows is Cuscoensis, which by the way doesn't grow at Cusco, right? I don't know why it was called that. Uh, Carol Knizza, who's famous for sending you plants you didn't order, um, is, is, <laughs> it, he actually described this plant, uh, all credit to him, it is a very good species. <clears throat> so there's some borsicax on the east side, uh, presumably bat pollinated flowers. These used to be called clistanthocereas. They make candelabra shaped, very pretty plants. And there's quite a few of them. You see a nice shaped plant. There's been a lot of confusion over the names. This one is Neo Resli. Comes from the far north. And then I described this plant after your countryman, Paul Hutchison. Paul found this plant back in the 1960s. He illustrated it, a lovely picture in, the, in your journal, in colour, in 1965. And he said, one day I'm going to describe this. Well, he didn't. <laughs> So when I went there and saw it and looked all that up, I thought it's appropriate to name this cactus after Paul Hodgson. And it's the only cactus they ever had named after him, actually. So there it is, and it's a very nice plant to grow. It flowers easily in the pot. It has a beautiful flower. So that's one I'd certainly recommend. I also named this plant, which people are again driven by. You know, if this was a salt curry beauty or a mammillaria, it would have had ten names. Mm -hmm. But because it's a serious, it doesn't have any at all. So, so, so I've described it as a longest serpent's erectus, because longest serpent is actually a snaky one, you know, it grows all over the ground, a bit untidy. This one grows upright, very tidily, and flowers when it's about a foot tall. So it's a very nice plant to grow. Grows around balsas, very common actually. Lots of people had commented on it, but nobody had really said, well, what's that then? Mm -hmm. And then one that pretends to be a bramble. Mm -hmm. uh, this used to be called Borsicac teller. Um, tenuous serpents, and you see the plant grows in a thicket. The, 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 the thin stems, which look just like a poorer cactus flagelli form this, uh, but they have a typical borsy cactus flower, they sort of arch over and then they root on the ground again and spread around like that. It's an amazing thing. Uncommon. Cold sensitive. Mm. There's only two cluster cactus, truly, in, in Peru. Most of them occur in Bolivia, Paraguay, Brazil, and so on. Uh, there's two. The one on the left is Morawetziana, said to be the only white flowered one, but really it's a sort of a pale green. Has interesting downward pointing flowers. Now on the right you've got pungens, which includes Brevis spina. I mentioned Coriocactus includes Erdizia. Well, here are uh, small Erdizias. Uh, they, they tend to have terminal flowers in either yellow or red, very easy to flower. The stems are a bit boring, but the flowers are quite nice and they flower consistently, regularly through the summer. Now this little chap here, who's about four foot tall, uh, lives in northern... Uh, he wears a big hat, presumably because he's not very tall. Now they, they, <laughs> they're made of leather, they're lovely hats actually. But he, he was very, very proud of his pachanoi, right? his Trichoceres pachanoi, which they plant outside their houses 
to ward, ward off evil spirits. I mean, some people eat them, of course, for other reasons, but, but they, put, they plant them outside their houses, and you regularly see them. That means, then, that we don't really know where Pacano originally came from. Um, but northern Peru, southern Ecuador is a reasonable guess. And there's lots of other plants, like this one here, which is uh, called Charlaensis, uh, which is closely related, and they occur all over. But it's because this plant has been used by man, moved around by man. The Incas moved it around, so we don't really know where it originally came from. Mm. Um, even now, in Trichocereus, mm, or Echinopsis, or whatever, um, there are new species, and in Bradley last year, Paul found uh, this new Trichocereus in the Sandia Valley. Now, look how wet that is. That valley is on the east side of Peru, and it's going down into the jungle. And this sort of dense vegetation on rocky patches we're finding quite a few new things, because people never look for cacti in this sort of environment. So Sandiens, it's a pretty plant to grow, and it's got an enormous white flower. Mm. So Espostos can get quite big. Mm. So there's my Indiana Jones impression on the right-hand side. Um, I borrowed Martin Lowry's hat for this picture, just for my neighbour. My neighbour's kids think I'm Indiana Jones. So I thought, <laughs> I'll take them a picture, just so that... Uh, they, uh, they, they'll keep believing it. Actually, they're getting a bit old now. I think they've tweaked the truth. So, on the left-hand side, uh, this is Esposta lanata in one of its many forms. Lanata is very widespread, and on the right is Lania nuligera. By the way, the people cut the tops off these to get the wool out of the cephalia to stuff their cushions. That's what the locals do. So the plants are often fairly well macheted. Mm. The one that grows near Balsas has got naked stems. This is uh, Mirabilis and a very interesting rib structure. The ribs sacrifice themselves into the cephalium and then multiply split up the back to make up the difference. Quite remarkable. Mm. So the cephalium in, in uh, Espostoas goes right through to the central vascular bundle, so it's in a deep groove. <clears throat> okay, so some Espostoas have no hair. I described Gabambensis from the same valley as Borsicactus um, Hotchisoni. Now, Hutchison, Lau, you name them, they all describe going down this valley and seeing these huge plants. There are millions of these plants in this valley. They grow to 30 feet in height, and nobody bothered to give it a name. <laughs> so I gave it a name, Utkabambensis, and then um, I, very kindly, um, uh, Myron Kimnak got me access to Paul Hutchison's notes in the Huntingdon. By the way, it's quite difficult to get to do that. Anyway, he did it. And, he looked, and I was reading through Paul Hodgson's notes ages after I described it, and he'd written in his notes about this plant, and he said, one day I will describe this as Echinopsis, as, Echi, as Espostoa Ucubambensis. So I don't know, I must have read his mind. It's an obvious name, but anyway, it's nice that he thought of it too. On the right-hand side is another one with golden spines and no hair that Ritter described as Espostoa calva, naked. Mm. And there's Ucubambensis. Look. You can drive for miles past hillsides of the thing. So I was quite pleased to name it, but why nobody else did it? I don't know. Mm. And then we also found this one. Paul and I found this, and Paul described it as Cremnophilus. This is the, near, the newest Esposto. It always has a, a right angle bend, a, you know, a sharp bend just below the cephalium. Amazing plant. But it only grows on vertical rocks, so it's extremely difficult to get near, and I've yet to get any seeds, so it's not in culture yet. Mm. But there are new ones. I think this must be new. I don't know what this is. This is the plant that attracted our attention when we found Machicana uh, rosiflorus. But it's a beautiful plant, and I just think it probably is different. Mm -hmm. Now, Trixanthocerus is closely related, nocturnal flowers, two species, Blosfeldiorum, bristly bases, very pretty plant, flowers when it's small. And then the other one, which can get very big, Senilis. This plant's oh, like 12, 15 feet tall, unusually big. So the two, this has nocturnal flowers, but they're bright pink. Mm. Rauceris. Rauceris nearest relative is Espostoa, amazingly. Uh, it's nocturnally flower and surely a bat flower, named for Werner Rau. It lives, again, in the Marignan Valley. Mm. My hero, Ritter, was very astute to spot that there's a new genus to be described here, Lazioserius. Now, you don't see these in culture very often. This one is Lazioserius fulvus, grows on rocks with Machicana Weberberry flamia, the orange one I showed you yesterday. They grow together. 
a long way away to the south, the other one, Rupicola. This big plant's near the road, everybody photographs it. It's in Anderson's book everywhere. It has another nocturnal flower. So these two plants look completely different, but Ritter spotted them as being the same genus and DNA supports his view. Mm. So I'm going to finish where it all started. Um, if you look at the phylogeny of, uh, of these cacti, you'll find that um, at the base of it um, is this remarkable plant, Calimanthium. This was another written discovery and, and a description. He described two species, but I think there's probably only one. Uh, it's quite a remarkable thing. It has uh, a trunk, and then it has stems that look quite like, well, you know, a hylocereus or something like that. Very few wings. When it flowers, the, new, the, the flower bud starts off like a shoot. And then the, these funny little petals come out of it. It actually makes a slit, and the little petals sort of drop out of this. So it's like a shoot that's just about becoming a flower. And it's, it, it, it's been shown to be basal, you know, to be ancestral um, to uh, the column, the cacti. So I think we're looking at a piece of, of, of history here. Uh, eventually, the plants become extremely large. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, here, our bottom left-hand corner. And they get big trunks. And the tree is huge, you know, it's like a proper tree, and several metres tall. So Calimanthium is a fascinating plant. It's quite easy to grow, and I've grown, I've actually managed to flower it in my glass house. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all the people who helped me, Paul Hoxie and Roy Mottram, and the Peruvian people who have always been marvellous to me on all of these trips. So thanks to them, and I hope they'll welcome me again when I go next time. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah.